I think getting leverage communication and then kind of try to align your your schedule, like financial schedule with the clients because each project is different. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I am your host, Ryan Willard, and today I am joined by Galsana Hashmati, a luminary in the world of architectural lighting design. She's based in New York City's vibrant metropolis. She is a visionary, architecturally trained educator and the founder of The Seed, a distinguished women-led architectural lighting design studio. Educated at the esteemed Eastern Mediterranean University in Cyprus with a bachelor's in architecture and further honing her craft with a master's degree in architectural lighting from the Polytechnic University of Madrid, Spain, Galsana's career has traversed continents. Her international footprint spans projects in Spain, Iran, Australia and the United States and each have contributed to her multifaceted expertise. Galsana's contributions in her field are nothing short of remarkable. She's been recognized globally. She was named among the top 40 under 14 lighting design talents in 2017, and she has garnered accolades such as the top 40 under 40 retail design award. In 2023, her outstanding work was celebrated with awards for visitor experience and museum exhibition alongside the prestigious Workplace Lighting Design Award. Among her many achievements stands the Argo Contemporary Art Museum, a cultural center where Galsana's mastery of lighting design shines brightly. This iconic project, which she illuminated in 2020, has earned acclaim, including the esteemed Argagan Awards and the coveted title of Design's Building of the Year. At The Seed, Galsana and her accomplished team, a mosaic of talents from architecture to engineering, share a profound dedication to lighting design's transformative power. Together, they craft environments that resonate with those who inhabit them, seamlessly blending innovation with human connection. In today's episode, Galsana and I discuss uh, some of the business principles that she's implemented to ensure a profitable and growth orientated business. Garsana was one of the Business of Architecture uh, smart practice uh, clients and practitioners. Uh, We've worked with her throughout her journey shortly after she um, set up her firm, which we talk about that. We also talk about what it's like as a consultant to be working with architects. And we get some really interesting insights there about what makes a powerful team, what kind of things really work well, and we address the elephant in the room, which is in many scenarios, when we talk to consultants who are working with architects, they struggle to get paid on time. Why? Because the architect themselves are not getting paid on time. So we talk about that this in depth. Galsana has been very powerful in the way that she leads her projects, the way that she's been able to Uh, either create her own contractual agreements with clients so that she can ensure that she gets paid. She gives us some really fascinating anecdotes of some stories of how she has um, helped an entire architecture team get paid on time. And she shares with us the details of how she does that, the kind of conversations that she leads with clients and with architects. And the frustration of what happens when these consultants aren't getting paid on time. Okay, so really important conversation. Uh, brilliant talking to Gal Sana. Very accomplished. Sit back, relax, and enjoy Gal Sana Eshmati. And now a message from today's sponsor. If you haven't used RCAT's Spec Wizard before, hey, now's the time to try it out. Spec Wizard is a patented tool that allows you to specify a product in just three steps, all for free and without even registering. Step one, research and find the right products for your project on RCAT.com. Step two, use the Spec Wizard tool to select the right products and options. Step three, generate a complete three-part CSI or CSC specification based on your selections. Now, maybe you enjoy toiling through long documents, parsing things together and creating a specification. And if that's your case, well, this probably isn't for you. But if you want to get it done in half the time that it used to, or even a fraction of that, RCAT is your place. Again, Spec Wizard is free to use and requires zero registration. So to use it, head over to rcat.com. That's A-R-C-A-T.com today and try Spec Wizard. 
RCAT is a fantastic resource and one that I counted on when I was actively practicing architecture to help me simplify getting these important specifications right. Kausana, welcome to the business of architecture. How are you? Hi, um, I'm really good. Uh, really excited to be on the podcast. Thank you so much for inviting me. My pleasure. I was very excited to have you on the on the show. You're a past um, BOA client, so we've worked with you uh, in the past. You're the founder of Seed Lighting. Um, you guys have got an incredible portfolio of lighting work, residential, institutional, um, and it's and it's also you know kind of you're at the forefront of driving this relatively new industry in and of itself and and are kind of occupying this really important part of architectural design and partnering very intimately and closely with architects um and we could talk a whole whole lot about just the importance of lighting and the more i'm learning about it as its own field <laughs> it's absolutely fascinating and and incredibly important as well it's like one of the easiest ways to to kind of up level the built environment is through quality lighting. So welcome to the show. Very excited to have you here. Perhaps we could just talk a little bit about your career and you could tell us about the genesis of Seed, how it started. Thank you so much. Um, before that, I want to I wanna just express how humbling this moment for me is to be a guest on Business of Architecture because I started um, Seed in 2018 just realizing that I had no idea about business. Um, mm -hmm. So I was just a sponge for new books, all the ebooks out there, all the podcasts. And a friend of mine recommended um, Business of Architecture. And I started and I became hooked and I listened to hundreds <laughs> of episodes. And being on the show after all these years, it's, it's just, um, it kind of looks like a milestone and I'm very, Amazing. very grateful for it. Yeah, thank you. And I hope this helps helps the people that are starting their business to get some insights. And um, yeah, so I, about Seed. So I started, well, I I have studied architecture and uh, worked as an architect for a, a little while. And then this is in Cyprus. And then I went to Spain. I did a master's in lighting design. I was working in Spain for some years in Barcelona. Then I moved to San Francisco. And from then there, I moved to New York. Um, mm -hmm. And a few years after moving to New York, I decided to start my own business, which was a very ambitious move um, because there are tons of lighting design studios in the city and they're all really great. There's yep. the quality of work that's been done. Um, it's really high. So competition was high and it was just this early 30s immigrant woman trying to find their their own net network in the city but i just had to do it so i went for it and um so that's how everything started that, and, that, yeah and it's it, been it, um, almost six years it, it's quite yeah. amazing actually that, um you know doing it in somewhere as kind of intimidating or slash inspiring as new york was that city was it was it more difficult or was it actually there was more opportunity because it's so intense, because there's so much competition, because there's so much more happening there? Yeah, I feel the second one. I think, I think um, just all these people here that are really talented and they're hustling for their dreams and you see them and it's just inspiring. Mm -hmm. I, for me, it was not intimidating. I just wanted to join. And, and also because of this fact, uh, it's it's not that if you even don't have a network from before, I didn't go to school here, but it's not difficult to start those conversations and those relationships in New York. That's what I felt compared to all those other places I lived. So when you first opened the doors, what were you doing to win those first projects? And, and what was it that had you get interested in the business of architecture and come on and become one of our clients in the, in the early days? Oh, okay. So, um, well, when I first started, it was me in a Chinatown co-working desk. And, um, but I just knew this is not a freelance work I'm doing. I wanted this to be full blown business and I had a vision already. Mm -hmm. Um, so I started to, so it was very, this part was, I think it was the most challenging to 
to make people trust you because I was an expert in lighting design, but I thought, and I, I knew how to do good work, but all the work that I've been done, I've been doing was from and for another firm. So I couldn't even advertise it. Mm -hmm. So I had to make people trust me. And I also, I was not, I didn't know how to do sales. And I always had this image of salesperson that I was not one in my mind. But then I soon figured that we're sales in everything anyways. We're either pitching a project or interviewing, or now this is my method. So, and I focused on what I'm good at, It's which is not going to tell someone to come work with me. This is what I did, but it was more in human connections. So, so mm -hmm. I attended every event and, um, you know, like connected with all the people that I knew. So I started to get projects and I also kind of similar to your story that you told on one of, uh, one of the podcasts you were talking about, which is I was used to high end, large scale projects. I was not used to someone calling me, oh, I'm redoing my basement. What type of two by two light fixture I should use. So, um, getting to that level, getting public projects was challenging, but, um, I think just uh, connect, connecting and I'm going to maybe open this further later on, but, um, for, for our, for lighting designers, it's much easier to build that network because my, my clients are architects. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot to talk about and we know each other's language. I'm not going to this unknown world of rich people telling them to hire me. Mm -hmm. So, um, that really helped, but yeah, so the first project I got, um, was actually a, a university called art school of for university of Columbia university, which is, was huge. And I had to hire interns and get to start to do that and grow a little bit. And this is all, um, back in 2018. So when COVID happened, uh, I, I lost so many contracts and like all, all those visions and you know I, what I wanted to do for the business kind of went on hold yeah. and I started to I realized what I have right now is time mm -hmm. from the things that makes a business work except I mean my expertise are there I don't have any money anymore so that's what <laughs> the only thing that's left for me is time so I decided to use it and invest on it and because I loved business for I was like I want to coach like this so I reached out to Enoch and um and he is a pretty good salesperson because after the first talk although it was way out of my budget I was like I'm gonna do this this is what I want to do and I think it so I invested a year of in co cabin coach and coaches and actually like learning what running a business really is and it's way more than just doing good projects so yeah yeah this was I think a pivot point in in what I was doing before and after COVID. What What are some of the things that you've implemented now that have really made the business kind of just less stressful, much easier? They're giving you peace of mind and and a lot of confidence. What have been some of the things that have been really that like you're really pr proud of that you've implemented? I think most importantly, I mean, most importantly, what I'm proud of uh, is it's my team because without them, this couldn't have happened um, where we are. And this team of, we're growing and they're, you know, high efficiency people. We are all working towards building this. So that's the most important thing I'm proud of, but also some th things that I implemented from, from the learnings of um, being in a coaching group was systematizing everything. So we built, I built systems for everything from the beginning and now everyone else in the team contributes to that um so yeah if you just have no idea about lighting design and join our office no one has to talk about anything with you you have all these videos to watch there are systems and templates so that really helped us helped our business be more efficient um and then delegate delegating um it i think this is hard for every creative person kind of starting a solopreneurship is but I just delegate and that's so so freeing and so actually like makes makes your um, business move so delegating mm -hmm. admin tasks delegating your IT delegating your accounting um, and delegating your projects 
So that is what I think was the, were the most valuable things. Also, plus all the financial insights that I had no idea about. But you, you mentioned there at the beginning, the team being the most um, thing that you're most proud of. How, how have you been able to, or what kind of insights could you share about A, attracting like decent people and B, holding on to them? So it, that's a great question because um, I think also another challenge for a, for a small business or for an entrepreneur is, is to attract talent, especially in New York City that there are all these other lighting design studios that they're more established. So they probably pay better and they, you know, they have some projects that students would be, I want to be here and I want to join. So making people trust you and come on board with your vision. It's like real building. So I think my pitch at the beginning was that, um, which is pretty, um, it's pretty honest, but it's, we're building something together. It's not that I build something and you join to help me. We want to be a team of creatives and we want to build something that maybe we, we're not offered in other places, which is a balanced environment. Um, we work with lots of transparencies. Everyone knows everything about the studio and they're important. So mm -hmm. even an intern joining joining seeds, they're, they're treated like an executive person. They have a voice. So I think that was, that's an important thing for us to keep. There was trial and error. I'm not going to say every person we hired worked out, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, I think it's more of inclusion, just creating a team of collaborators. What kind of transparency do you have like with, with financials and kind of profit and, money yes so i think actually um this is what what i do some people don't believe in it i recently had a conversation with my friend in barcelona and sh and she said oh you don't share these things with everyone but um it's i think um in order to make our projects more efficient i mean one thing that it's ethos of of my studio is that our most important project is our studio itself yeah how it runs and and everything else is a like, contributing to it but that's a nice way of it's more it. more important how we run yeah like how we, it's like a machine that it needs to be oiled well it needs to work well and every part matters so um then projects become our running projects correct in a in a correct efficient way and profitable is is our project mm -hmm. so we share the proposal fees with everyone especially project managers, they know what a schematic design is going to bring to the company and they know their rate and they know how many hours each person has. So they constantly check in where we are so that we don't work even a single hour free, which this was a big win because obviously when I started, I was low fees and working for free a lot. But I, and we do work for free, we do pro bono work but for mm -hmm. projects that mean something to us and it's, um, you know, impactful project, but yeah, we, so this, everyone knows where they stand and transparency on why you're, why is your billing rate this versus you don't make this much money, obviously. And this yeah. was my big questions always when I, when I was working with other studios before and I was like, why are you charging so much for me? <laughs> you know, I'm not making that, but so it's transparency. So in explaining the multipliers, explaining our expenses and the target revenue, everyone knows about it. And it's not embarrassing to have profit and it's not embarrassing for me to say, I want this much mm -hmm. and you can get here because this is the hierarchies here are just more, I mean, more inclusive. So you don't, it's not that only the owner is going to make money. If you're more efficient, we have a good bonus system that part of it is going to be distributed to you. So everyone works for that. Yeah. Amazing. I, I, that's so refreshing to hear because that's something, you know, it's a conversation that we have here a lot of business of architecture with many clients and, you know, we're very keen for people to develop a culture where it's more transparent with financials. And there's a, there's definitely like an old school, way of thinking and design businesses where nope you don't keep that you keep that knowledge private i mean sometimes you know it's yeah. so transparent that even the business owner doesn't know how much profit they're making and yeah. where their money is going <laughs> and that's really problematic um but it it you know it, it creates a different culture in the business where everyone can see that 
it's a healthy business and my salary is actually contributing to you know all the uh, you know the, the mechanism of the business is yet yeah, well we have to we have to charge the people who are doing the the production work out because that's the service that we're selling and actually what we charge you out yeah. also pays for the office manager and it pays for the rent and it pays for all the the cad programs and it pays for the the cleaning person to come in and and make sure that we've got a nice environment etc and it's not that's not always obvious when we first um you know when you first enter into a business and you know i've, I've shared before um I've had young architects call me up at their, and they've kind of been shocked and frustrated when they find out that their boss is charging them out at three times what they get paid. So how, yeah. how do you, do you, um, you know, how do you actually present some of this information? Do you have it like a, a kind of financial meeting where the whole team is involved or, and where is, and are there so any limits? I have... There is some limits, like uh, in in the way of, I mean, limits in a based on your, you know, if you're an intern, it's just the time that you're going to spend on getting to know yeah. this is going to be massive. So, but in general, I think, I mean, everyone that's a project manager in the firm, project manager meaning a senior designer, mm -hmm. not necessarily an executive, but um, we have sheets made it's like a google sheet document but we have for every project that we sign we fill in the phases and the fees and it's kind of we had someone make an automatic formulated sheet so it's uh, it generates your hours so every week the project managers need to look at it and see how we've been spending our time and um and i sit with with them and review it uh and then also I think and trans we do have um, with with more senior people we do have like financial meetings about target revenues and who is mm -hmm. getting a raise or all those things. But um, yeah, as far as transparency, I think one one thing that there is not enough transparency or there is no transparency. I think it's normal. It's um, it's everyone's salary. They don't, people yeah. don't know this. This is not okay in US. <laughs> but yeah, no, was, yeah, I, um, this, everything this else gonna... about a project people know. <laughs> That, that's that's in, i mean there's I've, I've watched studies where there have been companies who have been totally transparent with other people's salaries and that's the one that where everyone starts to get upset and it creates unnecessary that tension. doesn't work <laughs> yeah no, i think there's a i think that's that's yes. kind of the, the line but certainly the performance of the business and you know expenditure and how the finances are working is really really important and that people have got an ability to affect it with their performance and they can share back in the rewards of the of the organization um you mentioned a little bit about systems that you've implemented in the business and that you have been using videos can you tell us a little bit more about that about the sorts of things that you found really key for you to systematize and like how do you organize it how do you cure how do you curate those systems so it's um it actually has been a very, um, for me, fulfilling process because, you know, you know, you do things a certain way and you can never explain it. So um, what I learned from, from BOA is, is, was this platform. We use Views Loom, but um, when you're doing something while you're doing it, you record and you talk over it as if you're explaining to someone. But I think the most important ones, we started with kind of made a map of what are the things that are most important to be systematized and uh, we don't we want consistency in it in a, in the business so first we we have all um our server structure how you save something how you name something um where everything lives on our server and then how do we generate the del our deliverables what are the qualities what are the specifics that they all need to look the same mm -hmm. we do a lot of um technical documentation of lighting controls and um, you know all, all the technicals of how they go together at the same time how you reply to certain emails for the rep versus a client so there's a template for all of that in our system and um, and we have a separate so we have categories of ad admin systems that not everyone should watch everything and then we have project and, and then we have a financial so there's all systems and videos for everything but something that is um that i really enjoy is when i go to the channel and we have i see 
like a junior person recording a rabbit tip. It's like, oh, I did amazing. this and it worked. And, and then so we have, it's so, and without, you know, there's, they self initiated this and there's like, oh, my tips on Bluebeam or uh, all the softwares. Now they have their own fill, um, folder. So if someone's learning them, they can go. And I go there and learn a lot of things, obviously from, um, from everyone, <laughs> because I think they're better in softwares. And yeah, so this is the, the best part. That's lovely. That's that, that's really nice. The actual yeah. team is now kind of unprovoked yeah. making these little tips and, and sharing it. And then you have a kind of platform yeah. for, for shared knowledge. Um, the other thing you were talking about was delegation. And you kind of started to allude to the, the fact that actually as an entrepreneur, delegating whilst like intellectually, it seems really obvious. In practice, it's quite difficult. And particularly when you love what you do, we can get very emotionally attached to certain tasks. What sorts of things or what challenges did you face with delegation and how did you overcome them? I think um, one, I would say a positive thing about my personality is that I don't not, I don't have this ego of my design or my things, mm -hmm. but something that is not so great is that I'm very specific about graphics and how visually things look like. So I can't get away with a presentation that has things not aligned or it doesn't look good to me. So that was the ch most challenging for me was um, mm -hmm. how people, you know, it's, it's subjective, I guess, but um, we had to align graphically also in the, in the, um, what we're delivering. But I think uh, one, like I was lucky to, um, like my first, uh, my, well, well, one of my first um, senior um employees and collaborators uh, we had we used to work together so we share a lot of common um taste in in the way we deliver so that was very easy delegation so it was like your projects you do it uh we just check together but um i think one yeah and that was difficult but i think coming becoming comfortable with this the fact that i'll do this quicker myself and i do it better but having you having the developing that patience of I'm going to wait for you a week and mark up everything multiple times until you learn it. That was something that you have to develop and it's, it doesn't come easy. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot of patience. Yeah, it happens. It's like, it's what times a lot of patience, but <laughs> yeah. And, and, but people, if you are patient and you don't make the person that you're working with nervous or stressed out or make them feel they have to, do exactly what you want and you give them mm -hmm. that agency it's most of the time i would say like 90 percent of the time the result is a good thing and if you don't it's people make mistakes because they're not they don't feel they're doing they're in their sweet spot they're just doing what you want so yeah love it um let's talk a little bit about money and <laughs> the financial health of, of like, you know, of your own business mm -hmm. and then the financial health of other people's businesses. Cause it's one of, you know, one of my favorite topics, or it's not my favorite topic, but it's a topic I get the most animated about is late <laughs> payments mm -hmm. in architecture. It is everywhere that I see. I have seen so much shocking stuff with practices that have, you know, I've seen practices with, 80 90 percent of their total ar which is late i've seen practices that are carrying you know two million dollars worth of uh, late payments and their annual revenue is only about 1.25 it, you know it's it's really insane and it's it just seems like for architects that it's so commonplace that that we've just sort of accepted it and now if you're uh, a consultant who's working with an architect and they're leading the project and they're they're paying you late this becomes really frustrating and i've seen it from both sides of the architect and then from other consultants who are working inside of an architect led team and you guys are not getting you guys are not getting paid by the architect and the architect is refusing to allow any of the other consultants to liaise directly with the client and then taking on and wearing the hat of the leader but then is not leading the client to pay them properly it's a very difficult scenario. How how have you been facing this it or is. dealing with it? <laughs> it's 
So, um, yeah, I'm going to share my experience and also my yeah. insight. I think it's actually um, thinking about this and where um, we stand as consultants. Um, it's an it's a really particular position to be in because, um, as I said, everyone thinks that it's easier for us to get clients because I work with architects and it's it's lovely it's beautiful we have have we have this conversation we share the same values we went to the same school and so we can become friends my clients are people that I really know and they're we build this relationship and friendship and uh, so that at the same time it makes it much more difficult to do collections it's as mm -hmm. if you go to someone you know and you trust and you know they they're not doing this to become rich and you tell them like where's my money where where are you not paying my invoices so the i think the challenge is that um whatever we do like i really try it's and we have paid expensive price in in late fees on on, on payments from the clients it's we lost a lot of money a lot of revenue throughout up to this day but what what i do is and my team we kind of look back and see what can we do better you know all these steps that you can do but if your clients financial um, knowledge or the system that they follow it's rigged it just doesn't work it's uh, wrong it's really hard to fix anything because mm -hmm. the client the architects don't have the money they need to get it from someone and if they don't know how to do it no matter how many times i follow up and how many whatever um you know like steps that we take it's just not going to work well but we are and it's interesting that it happens more with with older um architecture offices because they're just used to this method and it's 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 a big challenge but i think i mean we're making baby steps and being better at it but just to tell someone that you're valuable you have to charge for your for your services because you know a lot you're coordinating this whole team mm -hmm. and now you're telling me i can't pay you because we pay you when we get paid and i'm i always ask why are you having you been paid do you need help <laughs> with that do you need me to call someone because it's been six months, like it's really strange, and uh, and I understand that you know the architects want to keep their relationships, and unfortunately we we were not thought to fight for for our values as as it as an industry, but mm -hmm. um, every architect for me is like you know um, if you have a developer that architects have and they love to work with and they repeated projects every client of mine is like that because architects are going to have more projects so i have this relationship even more it's with this person and i and imagine um i've been after this client and architecture office that is my you know like it would they're my idols working there and i love how they um, do design and their office environment and their ethos for sustainability. I just love all the things they stand for. And I go after this, I attend their events, I connect with every one of their employees. And at the end, after three years, they send me an RFP. So it's like, oh yay, big, big win. We're getting this project from our favorite office. And then they send another contract next, sign, sign this, you are the project and also sign this. And I read it and it's, we don't pay retainer fees to the consultants and remove the late fee clause from your contract. And I'm like, it, are you just telling me in my face that you're not gonna pay me on time and I have nothing to hold on to? So what do I do here? Just say no to all the efforts that I put to get this mm -hmm. client, to land this job. And and that makes it so difficult. So I, we yeah. have, what we have been doing is just pushing for direct contract with the clients because it's just, I don't want to go to an architect and say, let me teach you how to get your money from this guy. <laughs> so but that's, yeah. you know, that's really interesting because, you know, that, that's often my advice with, with, with other consultants is like, you know, circumvent the architect where possible, because if they haven't got the systems put, set up in place, you know, you've got the only other option you've got is to sit down and train them on how to get paid. And that's a big 
I mean, that can actually be quite a, you know, a bonding experience and, you know, collegiate, but it's a lot of energy. And, and to be fair, most architects aren't open to that. They're, it's not a, it's, it's more like, well, that's just the way it is. You've got to suck it up. Yeah, this is, this is the attitude. And I think because mostly this happens with um, large architecture firms that they have an accounting department that account department has no idea so they're like didn't you read the contract you're not going to get paid now and I'm like but <laughs> we're in this so i have to make long grind write a long um email and copy the principal and say we're in this together we are a design team we need to stand up for each other mm -hmm. so, you know i've i did it, all of this and i did pick the phone and talk to the ceo of the company to the more uh, higher positions and it helps, it always helps, but it just takes a lot of energy and time. And sometimes it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it does, but yeah. So uh, have you found more success in actually uh, contracting directly with the clients? How do you, how do you kind of allow the architects to, to allow you to do that? Or do you, or do you, yeah, are you quite firm and actually say, well, we're not going to work with you unless we get paid on time? For, I mean, we try to be pretty firm about this because of the bad experiences, because mm -hmm. I'm not going to um, take an architect that is my client to court, for example. Mm -hmm. It's just, this, it's so I clearly, I think the first thing that it's this honest communication, say, please have me directly contracted to the client because we want to follow up on our, on our um, late invoices. And it's just really difficult to do it with you directly because we know how to deal with the client. We know how to stop work. And then that makes you have to stop work. And that makes you help like us as a team. But mm -hmm. if you kind of push me to no, we want, we need to submit this. Although our invoices are not paid, it's just not going to work for us. It's, we have had uh, pretty bad experiences of unpayment and late payments with architecture firms. So I think the last one, kind of the example I was telling you of this firm that I really want to work, wanted to work with and their project and their clauses. So I told them directly that I want to be contracted by the, uh, by the developer and they said, no, we don't do this. Um, and I just, I mean, I think this is the biggest win, but I was like, okay, so I'm not going to work on this project or you have put me in touch with the, um, developer or we're not going to do it. Even though it was a very tough decision wow. yeah, and good they for said, you. okay, go ahead. If you can get money from them, if you can get a retainer fee, go ahead, feel free. So I, it was also surprisingly an easy process to have the client sign all of our requirements like they didn't even question a minute that i want my percentage of retainer fee they didn't question late fees when we so we we stop work we just really do because otherwise it's just cash flow and i need need to go credit get a credit to pay my people because the developer is not so yeah so it, it worked it actually really works much better to work with the client and which is it's sad to say this because I don't want to say, okay, you don't know how to do it. I'm going to leave you alone in this, but it's, it's sad that we can't, we can't be together and, and just make this happen. We are in the same industry, but yeah, yeah. but it so, works. So, I mean, that's amazing, right? So that you've actually, you know, you, you were able to negotiate with the clients, the terms and conditions that you want, and you're able to hold the client accountable to it. What did the architect do afterwards? Are they are they just kind of looking at you going, well, how the hell are they getting paid on time and we're still struggling? I don't know. They didn't tell me, but <laughs> they, they were just, <laughs> I, I hope it, that affected them kind of be more demanding on their financial, you know, like their rights, basically. Yeah. I, I mean, don't even I, I think mean, it's like being demanding. Yeah. I mean, I really hope like, you know, practices hear this and kind of hear themselves, you know, hear, hear for themselves, like, right, we're, we're really creating some issues here by not standing up for our, for our contracts and for our agreements and just, you know, it doesn't need to be confrontational or adversarial. It just needs to be assertive and for you to hold people accountable. Can you tell us a little bit about how you then hold the developer accountable to make sure that you get paid? You say that you, you maintain leverage on the project by kind of stopping work 
what does that process look like when you send out an invoice or how how do you do it and maintain a good relationship and not upset people it's not a i mean um, to be honest it's it's never a, a precise you know holding leverage there's all because our work is our in, invoicing time and um, schedule with the project schedule they never align exactly so you send your invoice and you have a month until your next invoice and in this month you finished the whole cd phase for example mm -hmm. so that's where um retainer fees come handy but i think what really helps helps uh, with developers is constant follow-up and um, communication like you're gonna have an invoice in two days here's your invoice reminders 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 phone calls and if they don't pay it's and then we don't even have to go to the um to the developers we just tell the architect we are not going to be part of this deadline because our invoices haven't been paid if so they have to now go fight for our invoices it's um basically um i think take getting leverage communication and then kind of try to align your your schedule like financial schedule with the clients because each project is different so if you mm -hmm. are um if you're you tell me i pay you every 45 days instead of your 30 days on the invoice then we need to adjust our deliverables or the when we send you reminders it's it's a difficult process but i think with developers has been much more easy um and it's like a good example is when you work with individual with if you're working on a residential project and you're working with a person that is there and understands you and their lawyers and and they don't question it it's just like this is your invoice and they pay it and i and i always question like why shouldn't this be everybody why shouldn't mm -hmm. we just be like lawyers and you know have a simple life <laughs> but <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I love it. So, if if you have you ever um, kind of collaborated with an architect then, and you've taken charge and said we're going to make sure that we that both of us get paid? Yes, <laughs> um, it's this happens. It happens a lot in uh, retail. In because okay. I work from a because of my background, a big chunk of what we do is uh, luxury retail stores. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, they're actually high-end rich people that are, you know, they're making this little purse with a pattern that costs this, the same fee of my whole project. And, <laughs> um, <Birkin> and, <laughs> and so that is because it's a, it's a very valuable client for the architects because they, one retailer makes um, 20 stores a year and around the US. So I I can see that it becomes really difficult to demand um what you <laughs> to actually demand what you have contracted for mm -hmm. um so uh, there was this this moment that um so we are on those projects too and we know like I know that retailers don't pay retainer fee and we accepted that We're like, okay this is not going to happen but at least we need to make sure we invoice monthly and if they don't at least I'm going to say we are investing just a month of work, not more, and stop work. That's basically mm -hmm. how I made the peace with this fact that they don't pay retainer fees. But um, so once uh, the client didn't pay, they didn't pay any of our invoices for a long time. And the architect was like, oh, there's this new store opening and I'm send you drawings. Can you send it out by the end of the week? And and I was just then was very frustrated of not being paid by this client. Um, mm -hmm. I have a mentor that actually this is like a reverse story, but I, I have a mentor that he, he was, he had a boutique um, architecture office that is only luxury retail and he sold his company and he retired and I go to him sometimes. So I told him this, this brand is not paying anyone. And he said, well, because that's that brand and, you have to wait. Uh, it's normal. This is the price you pay to be to say I work with this name. Mm -hmm. So I left that meeting and I was like, "This is not, this is not <laughs> correct." <laughs> you know, I have all this respect for you. This is not okay. So 
I picked up the uh, so I pick I sent I, and I realized like all the junior people that or project managers of the architecture firm they have n no idea what this means. So I first called one of them and I said I'm not going to do this project the new one. You're not going to get your drawings by the end of the week because imagine that someone tells you you're not going to get your salary in six months. Are you going to still go to work and work hard? And she was like, Oh, I understand. And you know because architects are just humble nice people like we are all together in this but they just don't they need to be put in that place so so she just was speechless so then um and i said i know the client i know the you know the client person in like the, the regional of this brand so i'm going to call them and they hate this they are those architects don't like you to directly contact the retailer and I said, I know them and I'm going to email them. Kind of like not wanting to threaten them, but just telling them I'm going to do this. And and the CEO of the architecture firm that like, hardly ever responds to any of, like, he called me personally. He was like, I'm sorry you were not paid because we were not paid. Um, but this this is a repetitive. You should think that this is a long-term investment. Um, and I just said, I just can't do this because I'm going to go out of business if with this mentality. And and I said, wow. just let me call this person. <laughs> and I said, and let me call this person and make him pay us all. So he agreed. So I pay. I called um, the construction manager of this brand, and I said, we have not been paid as a team. None of us. I'm going to stop work. It's easy for me. But the architects can't work with that consultant so we had this converse long conversation and in, we were all paid the day after obviously with a lot of negotiations of okay so remove oh. your late fees or those things but it's okay mm -hmm. we just got paid after six months and that was like really huge for me to do and wow uh, and i also yeah it was good that's an amazing story and and what's really fascinating about that is how like the the kind of senior architects in this position were mm -hmm. defending the fact that they were getting paid late they were almost kind of protecting it and kind of being like well that's just the way it is we've got to deal with it or don't or don't do anything so yeah amazing amazing that's I mean, I normal could, yeah <laughs> I, I could almost imagine you know you structuring an agreement with an architect and saying look we either work with the client directly and we get contracted directly and we sort out our own payments or if we work with you then we're the ones who control getting paid and i've got a system in place where i can make sure that both of us are getting paid on time you could even charge an extra fee for getting their fees in on time I on know. top of that it's, a collection. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a collection exactly it's a collection Put in a proposal <laughs> like helping you with collections <laughs> Yeah, I love it. Like a little, like a little percentage of all their of all of their collections that they can't get themselves. But that, that that's yeah. that's really you know, and it, it that's that's really amazing and really kind of just inspiring to hear that as a as a story. And you know, it's it's kind of confidence, and you haven't upset any. Did you upset anybody in the process? Did anyone get angry at you? Was there any shouting? Was yeah, there they any... they. Nobody was shouting. It's just demanding what you worked for. Nobody can shout. They're always embarrassed. And I, this is the 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 part that it's. I feel that it's the sad part of all this, is that, you know, when I want to negotiate with a client with a developer, they are here to make money. Mm -hmm. They're here to make you the bank, and get more interest on their money or you know. They don't care, but architects are not like that. We all went to the same school and we want to design beautiful places and not care about money and much, you know, this is like the unfortunate message of, uh, of an architecture school, but they're not here to take advantage of me. And I know that. So there's always, they're always embarrassed for not having paid you. Yeah. It's not that they're, you know, stand up here and say, well, I don't pay you now because I don't want to. It's that never happens yeah so that is the, the sad part but also yeah so it's so what what can we do to stop this together it's i think it's a very important conversation to have amazing i love it i love it that's really inspiring gosana and i think 
Um, just before we, we wrap up here, what have you got planned for the rest of the year? I know you guys have just moved studio. How did the studio move go? Yes, it's great. It's great. We have a lot more room, so room to grow as well. Um, moving, I think for first seed is um, just a little bit growing, not too much. Um, but I want to make my marketing more intentional uh, because now we have been just being a lot of referrals and old clients coming back, but um, kind of like delve into um, different typologies of projects, getting more cultural work, saying more no to so many things. Um, so this is the, the new, <laughs> the future for us. And one thing I want to add uh, to wrap up our conversation about financials is that I work a lot with emerging young architecture firms that's basically what I realized um, it's the best place for us to be and collaborate with younger architecture offices that they just started or same time as us. And that is really refreshing because the, I feel the, that the future is bright for architecture or financially as, um, because they're not, they don't buy into all those, you know, like yeah. um, fossil <laughs> industry <laughs> rules that they're, they're just like, we just sit together and decide to do something and and design something right. And yeah, that's true. We're not business people. We are not developers, but we all live and we like to make money and we need to value our, our work. So I think this effort is a collective effort. Uh, it's something that needs to be brought up at schools. I mean, I try to tell that to all my students constantly, but it's something that we can do together. And it's not one firm doing something not right it's us as a whole as an you know a profession that we just need to come together and stop this and i i i'm seeing that getting better and better by day by it's just so nice to work with an architecture studio that has just started um like five years ago and it's like they just know clearly what they want to ask for and they find those clients and they do it so no one is gonna you know just wait for a year for a developer mm -hmm. to respond to their emails. Okay. Love it. Amazing. Really, really inspiring, Galsana. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much. This that. was great. And that's a wrap. And one more thing. If you haven't already, please do head on over to iTunes or Spotify and leave us a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show and we'd love to get your feedback and we'd love to hear what it is that you'd like to see more of and what you love about the show already. And now a message from today's sponsor. If you haven't used RCAT's Spec Wizard before, hey, now's the time to try it out. Spec Wizard is a patented tool that allows you to specify a product in just three steps, all for free and without even registering. Step one, research and find the right products for your project on RCAT.com. Step two, use the Spec Wizard tool to select the right products and options. Step three, generate a complete three-part CSI or CSC specification based on your selections. Now, maybe you enjoy toiling through long documents, parsing things together and creating a specification. And if that's your case, well, this probably isn't for you. But if you wanna get it done in half the time that it used to, or even a fraction of that, RCAT is your place. Again, Spec Wizard is free to use and requires zero registration. So to use it, head over to rcat.com. That's A-R-C-A-T dot com today and try Spec Wizard. RCAT is a fantastic resource and one that I counted on when I was actively practicing architecture to help me simplify getting these important specifications right. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.